some kind of music in our background, but I also feel like I should have used a black screen so everything was in white. Um, some of the words that stand out are diversity, freedom, opportunity, at the same time oppression, injustice, but justice is there too. Um, oppression, I think I already said that. Individualism, um, equality, powerful, hopeful. Yeah, the yeah, this is super interesting. Um, I'm going to go back to, I wish, I wish I could have this on the screen as we move forward. Um, I'm going to take a screenshot of it um, in a little bit. Um, here's the thing, is some of these words, justice, injustice, opportunity, privilege, freedom, oppression, they're opposites. And I, I want you to think about why they're opposites. I want you to think about um, why would somebody see freedom and why would somebody else see oppression? This is a poem, um, we're gonna listen to it. It's about five minutes long. And the reason why I chose this version, there are a ton of versions on YouTube, but I chose this version in part because the words will be there, you'll see them. And, and to me, the ability to hear and read is really helpful. Um, I'm probably more visual than, um, you know, like auditory in my learning style. Langston Hughes is an African American poet um, who was born in 1901 um, and died in 1967. And this poem was written in 1935. Um, Tell me, context matters. What was happening in 1935 that's relevant to, that might be relevant to understanding as we begin to listen to this poem? Um, just unmute yourself and um, share as you think about it. Um, the Great Depression. <laughs> Yeah, the Great Depression is a huge, huge thing. Um, people losing their homes, people unable to eat, people being homeless. Um, yeah, it's 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 pretty bad. Um, anything else that we should know about um, what was life like for a black man in 1935? Um, I mean, oppression, segregation, all of those, um, there hadn't been, the, the civil rights movement hadn't happened yet, and still, so there's still a lot of really pressing struggles. Yeah. Okay, and I think it's important to read those things, because he's going to talk about a lot of the values that you put into the word cloud. And um, but he's going to present them in a very specific way. So I want you to think about what the argument, the claim that Langston is making about America, um, and those values that are often associated with America. So. Um, Okay, so here we go. Um, going to press play.
Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plane, seeking a home where he himself is free. America was never America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love, where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme, and any man be crushed or one above. It was never America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real. And life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There has never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark, and who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white. Pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, a mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit. Power, gain, or grab the land, or grab the gold, or grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the man, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker sold to the machine. I am the Negro serving to you all. I am the people humble, hungry, mean. Hungry yet today, despite the dream. Beaten yet today, oh pioneers, I am the man who never got ahead. The poorest worker, Martin Lunis. Yet I am the one who dreamt our basic dream. In the old world, while still a servant king. Who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true. That even yet his mighty daring sinks. In every brick and stone, in every furrowed turn, that's made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I'm the one who left Dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lea and torn from Black Africa's strand, I came to build a homeland to free. The free? Who set the free? Not me. Surely it would be. The millions on relief today, the millions shot down when we strike, the millions who have nothing for our pay. For all the dreams we've dreamed, and all the songs we've sung, and all the hopes we've held, and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be. The land where every man is free. The land that's mine. The poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pay, whose hand at the foundry, whose plow in the rain, must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stay. From those who live like leeches of people's lives, we must take back our land again, America. Oh yes, I say it plain. America was never America to me, and yet I swear this oath: America will be. 
Out of the wreck and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of craft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains and the endless plain. All, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. What I'd like you to do right now is um, I'm going to put um, I'm going to put in the chat a copy of the poem so that you can reference it. So if you want to click on that in another window, and I'm going to put you into um, breakout rooms of uh, three or four. What I'd like you to discuss in your breakout rooms, by the way, introduce yourselves to each other. Um, you know, like your name, where you're from. Um, and then I want you to find, you know, like to talk about and analyze, you know, like what, what was Hugh's argument? What is the main point he's trying to make? And, um, how is he doing it in a way that is, um, how's he doing it in a way that's persuasive? And so you can think of the words he used, but you can also think um, of the presentation. I chose this presentation for a reason because I think that um, there was some elements of this persuasion, this, um, presentation that made the idea stand out. So, um, breakout rooms. Let's see, there are 28 of us. And so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to put you into seven breakout rooms. Um, and yeah, seven breakout rooms. And just talk about those things. You'll have about um, three and a half minutes and then we'll come back and we'll share together, okay? So you'll get that invitation and then you'll have a warning. Um, important, make note of the number of your breakout room because they'll be like number one, number two, number three, that kind of thing, okay? There you go. you're back. Um, almost everybody's back now. So I'm going to call on group numbers. There are seven groups. And um, I'm just going to call group one and I'm going to ask a question and anybody from group one can be the spokesperson. Um, yeah, I'm good with any of that. So what did you see as being the main point of the poem. Um, group one, anybody from group one can share. We talked a lot about how um, he was talking about all the promises that America, you know, was kind of um, saying that they like are founded on and that they uphold and how there are so many citizens of the country who were not, um, who didn't receive those promises and face um, oppression and just nothing that they were promised that he like kept talking about um, and how it was almost, you know, just like, it's just not fair. And it's not like, even though he, um, he likes the idea of the American dream, it's just not realistic to a lot of Americans. And I think that was like the main idea. Yeah, it, does anybody else have anything they wanted to add to that?
Yeah, I think that that was nicely stated, Sienna. The, the thing that, that I would, if I were gonna word that in a sentence, is it would be that although the American, the promise of America, uh, freedom and opportunity is wonderful, it's not available to everyone and it needs to be. And the people who it's not, now I'm not making it into one sentence. My brain is just kind of going. It, it's like the people need to gather together and work together to make it that promise for everyone. Not surprisingly, and I don't know if that, I think that particular video, when you go on YouTube, it was the one that was made for Bernie Sanders campaign. Um, we the people. Um, but anyways, another, another question is, what were elements of the poem or the presentation that made that argument so powerful? There were lots of things going on there. Um, group two, name one of the things that you thought really made that idea stand out. Um, so for our group, we talked a lot about like how the national anthem would play in the back of like certain parts of the um, poem and it seemed to get a little bit more louder and more emphasized like when it was parts like speaking about like the oppression and like it was just kind of like the symbol of like American freedom and the American dream playing over all the people in America that are still oppressed and like aren't benefiting from the American dream almost. Uh, yeah, great point, Corey. Um, I, I felt that too as I was listening to it um, because we associate so many beliefs and feelings and values with that national anthem and to have it juxtaposed with the call that it's not the things that, I mean, it's that contrast. Here's what we associate with the national anthem. Here's reality for many Americans. Yeah. Um, group three, what is another element that stood out to you on the, you know, like that made the argument more persuasive? Okay. Um, so in the poem, he, talks about, um, you know, different aspects of, you know, things that are basically listed in the Constitution or Bill of Rights um, that may make, like, America the land of the free. But as we talked about, he emphasizes that it's not for, for a lot of people. But what he does as well to emphasize that argument is he's saying, I am, I am. And the repetition of I am kind of emphasizes that he himself is part of that marginalized group, that America is not free to him, is not um, this... Um, there's no equality for him because he's emphasizing all of these pieces of evidence that show that no, America is not what you think it is. And here is my anecdote to show that. Um, great observation, um, Javier and group three, that repetition, I am, I am. And every time that I am is a different, I am the poor white, I am, I am, I am. And every one is a different one because it's not just one group of people that's been that barriers have been set up for the American dream. Um, yes, that is super. I hadn't thought of the repetition. I thought of the examples that he used, but that repetition of I am, I am, super powerful. Group four, another element that made, the, um, made it stand out. Um, I feel like one of the elements, oh, sorry. Let's see. Yeah, okay. Um, I feel like one of the elements would be like the passion in his voice too. Like at one point, like he starts like talking and then he like takes like small pauses and then he continues like how um, Javier was saying, like he kept saying I am and like he sounded really like passionate and like I just think just like his voice tone in general, like it makes the poem sound even more and like get the point across of it. Yeah. Um, group five. 
Hi. Um, I think one of the like biggest points or like one of the things he said that like made a huge impact on the point he was trying to make was um, the fact that he kept saying America was never America to me. And he um, he mentioned he mentioned slavery. He mentioned immigration. He um, basically was saying that those are all the things that built America. Yet all these groups of people are still being oppressed um, and not receiving those freedoms that they deserve. Yeah, very much a contrast. And it's like, here's the people who built America and here are the people that benefited from it and here are the people who didn't benefit. Um, that, that, again, the juxtaposition, the contrast, super, super powerful. Um, Alexis, were you in group four or five? I was in group five. Okay, group six. Yeah. Group six. We mainly just discuss the hypocrisy of like American ideals, how it's built on this image that like it was built for people that were being treated unfairly and that you could come here and accomplish everything and how it was kind of, it's at this time, especially it was kind of just a cycle of poverty and oppression for those who weren't in the intended group of to benefit from America. Yeah. I, you know, like there is that um, it's interesting you choose the word hypocrisy and yet there is a certain amount of hypocrisy if we say um, America is the land of freedom, but then we keep some people from being free. That is hypocrisy. And it's a disappointment um, when it's promised that it's going to be this thing. And then you feel like maybe you're less free than somebody else. Um, right. and, and that's, and this was very much Hugh's experience. He wasn't one of those people that opportunity was available or true freedom was available. Um, and so over and over and over, he had barriers. Um, group seven, anything else in the presentation or the poem itself that stood out to you? Um, I mean, we discussed a lot of what everybody else said that was probably um, more visible in the poem. But what we, I think, personally made it more power, powerful was that he was pretty blunt and frank about his main message as opposed to like dancing around it and being cryptic. A lot of the time with poems, especially in the past, they like to um, make it fancy and sound nicer and then they kind of dance around the main message. But he he got right to the point and made sure that everybody knew that uh, America wasn't America to him, it wasn't America to anybody of color and any person who was poor. He did a really good job of portraying his message right away and throughout the whole poem and didn't make it confusing at all. So I thought it helped to make it very powerful. Yeah. Um, Alyssa, was there anything that stood out to you that was on the persuasiveness of this? You know, I think that a lot of them hit it hit it on the head like I was gonna say having the national anthem in the background was very um, powerful and how it got louder um, to emphasize certain points and I also noticed the repetition of the words I am um, yeah I think this class kind of definitely understood the message of it so that's pretty cool yeah. one thing that was really powerful to me and I think it was either Corey or Litzy talked about the tone of the voice of a speaker. So like in the beginning, you have this really, um, I don't know, this British accent and it's bold and this is the land of the free and you know, like there's all opportunity everywhere. And then here's that little voice that you almost can't hear. America was never America to me. And then the bold voice again, and then again, the small voice. And finally, the bold voice asks, who is that that mumbles in the dark and dares to sp or sp spread darkness on the veil of stars, you know, like the flag? And, and that's where we get the IMs. And so it was very much that there's two people speaking. 
in this poem. There's the the voice of the people who there is freedom and opportunity for, and then the voice of the people who don't have that. And I have read this poem over and over and over again. And that was the first time I caught the two voices. And now that voice that mumbles in the dark actually has a voice, um, which was super, super powerful to me. Um, I want to um, go back to the PowerPoint really, really quickly, because I wanted to um, talk about, oh, yeah, there we go. That's what you did. Um, this is a rhetoric class. It is not an English class. And this may be the for some of you, this is the first rhetoric class you have ever taken, that we're solely focused on rhetoric. And I know you've heard that word before, probably in a high school class, um, maybe AP Lang, um, if you took an IB class, um, ERWC, I don't even know what all those initials stand for, but some of them I do. But I think it's important to understand that when we're talking about analyzing text, we're gonna be coming from it from a rhetorical lens. And I wanna talk a little bit before we close out, what is rhetoric? Rhetoric is, said Aristotle, the ability to determine the available means of persuasion. Meaning if you wanna persuade somebody, there are a lot of ways you can do that. Langston Hughes could have written a different type of poem, but he chose to do this two-voice poem of the people who it is freedom for and the people who it isn't freedom for. He chose to speak not just from his viewpoint as a black man, but the viewpoint of the poor white, the Indian, the Negro, the Irishman, um, people who worked without money, people who didn't have jobs, people who didn't have food. He becomes the voice of all of the oppressed people in America at a time when, 1935, there were a lot of oppressed groups in America. And so Langston Hughes made conscious choices on how he was gonna persuade. Richard Weaver, um, is a rhetorician and he defined or described rhetoric. He says it moves the soul with a movement that cannot finally be justified logically. Why did, why did I feel goosebumps when I heard the national anthem and it was getting louder? That was an emotion I was feeling and emotions aren't always logical. I mean, I tried to explain it, but you know, um, rhetoric moves the soul and it persuades in subtle ways that creep in and we, it's not necessarily this thing or that thing. He says, all things considered rhetoric, noble or base as a great power of the world. At its truest, it seeks to perfect men by showing them better versions of themselves. And I think this poem um, presented in this way is challenging Americans to seek to have the America that was promised. But the reverse is also true. Um, rhetoric can be used to manipulate people's beliefs for political ends, um, to inform attitudes or induce actions in other human agents. I'm skipping over a lot of stuff. And the thing is, is it influences us. That video and the discussion influence us because of the ways we see the world. And we're going to label that under, underlying assumptions, pre-existing beliefs. Um, we might call them, um, we might call them worldviews, um, our perspective reality that guides thinking, um, givens, ideas and facts we take for granted, things we believe to be true. So if you believe that opportunity is available for everybody, you might not question or look for data on whether or to what extent that is true. You might just go, of course there's an American dream. Um, 
beliefs, things that are accepted, consider it to be true, held as an opinion, or the values that you hold that shape your life. All of those are underlying assumptions. They're things that are in our psyche and often subconscious that we, we might not have even identified them or recognized them, but they are influencing the way we see the world. They're influencing what we see as reality and what we don't see as reality. So I'm gonna pause there. We only have two minutes. Um, last thing is I have a reading for you. I'd like you to read before Monday so we can discuss it. And the reading is titled American Values and Assumptions. Gary Alfin headed up an international students at the University of Iowa and he wrote to help them adapt to American life because if you're not from America or you've spent significant time in another country, you might look at Americans and you go, whoa, these things are really strange. These people are not like, they're not like the people at home. And if you've lived in America very long, you just go, eh, that's not strange, that's normal. But Gary Alfin is writing for, he's not writing for us. You are not Gary Alton's primary audience. And so you need to keep that in your head. So I want you to think who is his primary audience and what is his purpose? Um, what beliefs or underlying assumptions does Alton assume his primary audience has about America or Americans? How does he appeal to that primary audience? In other words, how does he do what E. Shelley Reed suggests and adapt to audience and purpose? And as you read, think about how your values and beliefs compared to the ones that often describe. Um, think of examples and experiences in your life that might have made your values similar to what often describes or what might have made them different. And then any other values you think he should have included. By the way, this I'm skipping away from, I'm gonna stop share so you don't see those anymore. But this PowerPoint is on Canvas and the video will be too. And those questions are available along with the article on the very last page of this week's Canvas. Okay? You don't have to write anything, just read it, annotate it, think about it, and be ready to talk about it on Monday. So, um, questions for me. Um, I had a question about the journal assignment that's on Canvas that's due tomorrow. Um, I was just having a little trouble submitting it, just like the text box and everything for it. Yeah, for some reason I didn't make the text box, but it's there now. Thank you, Corey. Um, there are so many teeny tiny pieces of Canvas and I'm missing some of them in my rush to get everything on the board. And um, so just shoot me an email and, you know, like, Call that to my attention. Thank you um, for those of you who did and prompted me to fix it. Um, yeah, it's a little embarrassing, but I am human. Um, other questions? Javier, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, there's a, a Google form for like an introduction about ourselves. And so I did that through the external link you sent after the Zoom yesterday but it's still in Canvas. Do I need to do it again to submit it? No, you do not. I, okay. um, that was my, okay, so that's my first experiment with a Google form and it didn't work exactly how I thought it did. It worked great, exactly the way it's supposed to, but I thought it would be a little different. So okay. you'll get those points. I think, I think about half of you have those points already and the other half is just waiting for me to go through it. Any other questions? All right, then let's wrap it up. And you have plenty of work on Canvas to do. And um, I look forward to, great job on discussion, by the way. I look forward to talking to you again on Monday. Bye-bye.